Hey, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to No Enemies Here in Conversation. And today, I'm happy to have a man who absolutely needs no introduction, but I shall introduce him, Ted Racer. Now, um, I don't know Ted, so we're going to discover Ted together, right? I'm going to ask him a lot of crazy questions, and hopefully he's going to answer these crazy questions. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, here is Ted Racer. Hey, Ted, how are you? Hello, everyone. I'm fine, thanks. <laughs> so, Ted, Ted. Yes. Okay. So, I'm going to ask you. I'm going to ask you the the boring first question. Okay. And the question okay. is, what got you into games and especially war games? And what was the game that hooked you? I I'm um, older. Than than I like to be. <laughs> I'm, I'm 63 now. And uh, I, when I grew up, I grew up, my, my, my father playing Risk and Stratego, and then later the Milton Bradley games like Dogfight and, and Broadsides and Battle Cry came along. And uh, then in um, 1969, my father, who was born in 1914, uh, bought the Avalon Hill game 1914, uh, which was way over my head at the time. Um, but I couldn't, you know, I couldn't take my eyes off it. It was just fascinating to look at. And um, and a few years later, in a toy store, I found Avalon Hill's Stalingrad and Africa Corps and bought those. And then I had a friend who got into it, and then he discovered SBI. And... Ever since then, I mean, there was a period in the 80s where I didn't do a lot of war gaming. Not a lot of war gaming, a lot of war games were being published. Um, but basically, I've been in the hobby since, like, 1969. And it's funny you said 1914. And um, I'm just going to preface with this. Like, when I was speaking to Ted behind the scenes, Ted said, Let's not spend too much time on Paths of Glory. And I understand that. I mean, how many times can you listen to Stairway to Heaven or being asked a question about Stairway to Heaven? But you see where I'm placing the Paths of Glory? I'm placing it quite high. So World War I, is that why you're, you're – I'm going to say you're an aficionado of World War I because that's what I know you from. Is it because of the 1914 game? Ted. And ladies and gentlemen, as I said, he didn't want to. He didn't want Ted. You're back. I'm back. Did you hear what I said? No. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll repeat it. So you had mentioned 1914, the yeah. game. All right, Avalon Hill, and Carlo Paradzi actually uh, loaned me that game once. It's um, uh, one of those big, thin, boxed games, right? So is this is is this why you're uh, and to me? Uh, is this why you're a World War One aficionado? I I I wouldn't I don't know that that's why I I developed an interest in the history of World War One and I kept waiting for somebody to produce you know the World War One games I was looking for and very few games were being produced on the subject and most of the ones that were being produced didn't work for me all that well and finally I just said. You know, if if I'm going to play the World War One games I want to play, I'm going to have to make them. <laughs> no, I understand. Um, actually, I knew um, I knew a musician who didn't who was a guitar player who uh, didn't like the guitars around the world. So he he became a, a a I think we called him a luthier or a luthier, a guitar maker, and he made his own guitar. So I mean, yeah. Um, I, I was going to say something. I was going to say something. Uh, why point to point? On Paths of Glory? Um, well, Point to Point had been sort of the standard for car driven games. And I was introducing a whole bunch of new stuff. And I, I wanted there to be some familiarity for people who had played We the People or. or oh, I see, okay. So, and it works, it works fine. It, you know, I mean, 
point to point is basically, um, you know, you can, you can connect the points however you want. So, you know, you can make it fit the topic. Yeah, no, I see that. I see that a lot. Uh, because I mean, making, uh, obviously making a tactical game on, on world war one, which probably you can, uh, defeats the purpose maybe. I mean, there there have been. I mean, there are some tactical, or at least grand tactical games in World War One. Uh, it the thing is that people think that World War One was all the Western Front trenches. Right, right. And it wasn't. There was a lot of movement going around on the Eastern Front, in in the Middle East, uh, and even in the West in 1914 and 1918. So it's not all just, you know, it's not all just trench warfare. Although that obviously was a major part of it. So, so Ted, um, if you don't mind me asking, um, what do you do? What do you do in life for money, that is? Uh, this is what I do now. Um, right now you design games, period? Period, yeah. Wow, uh, that's fantastic. Congratulations. Thank you. There was, there was a time I worked in bookstores, but, uh, but now I just design games. Uh, um, okay. It, it, it helps that Joanne is a speech pathologist and they get paid rather well. But <laughs> it's funny. I I actually have a friend. Her name is Joanne and she's a speech pathologist. <laughs> I swear to God. Anyways, uh, Ted, I'm going to take a question right away because bang, it, it came on. So I, can you read the question? Or would you like me to read it for you? I can read it. Uh, should I read it aloud or? Yeah, it's sure. The latest GMT update said you were working on a Napoleonic-themed game. Can we know more? Uh, yes, you can, if you're interested. Um, the, the game is entitled I, Napoleon. Um, it is not a war game. It is a solo historical role-playing game where you take the, the role of Napoleon starting as a captain in 1793 and the object of the game is to work your way up to be emperor and ruler of Europe. Um, and uh, along the way, you have to deal with battles, obviously, uh, but, but as you, would, uh, you have to deal with politics, you have to deal with diplomacy, you have to deal with your love life, uh, your love life, because one of your aims is to produce an heir. Um, so, you, you know, there are various potential wives. There are a bunch of mistresses. Um, mistresses are important because um, if your wife turns out to be barren and you want to divorce her, you have to have produced a bastard son first. So, you know, the problem isn't you. <laughs> so, so, you know, all of this is mixed up in the game. Um, and uh, it's in the hands of GMT. It's in the hands of developer uh, Ken Kuhn, and um, uh, he's enjoying it, which is always good when your developer doesn't go, yuck. Um, so um, it should be on the P500 next month, and um, I'm excited about it. It's, it's, a, it's a very different thing. Man, I, you know, it, it's funny. Eh? I just, I promised myself that I wouldn't be buying any more games for a while, and you just nailed it, and I'm going to have to buy that game. Now, it sounds like a role-playing game to me. It is. It is. It's a, it's a solitaire role-playing game. You're, you're, it, it involves, there is, a, there is a board, there is a map, but it's, you don't move pieces around on the map. The map is full of boxes where you place various cards and tracks where you, you track your glory level, your diplomacy, your, your domestic political points. Um, and, but basically the game comes with 220 cards. They're divided into three decks, a, a commander deck, a first council deck, and an emperor deck. And you start as a commander, and you, as I said, you try and work your way up to be emperor. And then once you're emperor, you try and take and hold as much of Europe as you can. But you could end up, you know, you could end up losing and in exile. You could end up assassinated. You can you can catch a venereal disease from a mistress. There are all kinds of things that can happen in the world. No, but this, I, I mean, it's funny, Ted. This doesn't sound like a Ted Racer game. So what happened? Um, there is a, there was a game, um, done by Clash of Arms called Legion of Honor. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And Legion of Honor is a is a, basically a card role playing game where you start out as a sergeant or a lieutenant in in the revolutionary armies and maybe work your way up to Marshal of France. And when I was playing it, I said, "This is fun, but wouldn't it be interesting if it were Napoleon himself and not some random sergeant or lieutenant?" And that was the inspiration for the game. That's 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 awesome. I'm trying to get that game. By the way, the um... The Clash of Arm games. What's it called again? It's a uh, of Honor, uh, Legion of Honor. Legion of Honor. Okay, I don't know if it's still being published. I don't know. I, I you can probably still find it at a reasonable price, even if it's not. The yeah, price. probably at Noble Knight or something. And by the way, Noble Knight people, like, you get ten percent if if you put no enemies here. Ten, you get ten percent at Noble Knight. I just Ted, I had to put that in. What can I tell you? That's fine. I use Noble Knight, so. <laughs> What's 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 the difficulty uh, rating on on that game, your game? Um, it's not it's not going to be difficult at all to play. It is going to be difficult to win, but um, but on the other hand, winning is just sort of what you're aiming for. The real point of the game is that every time you play it, it's going to produce a different narrative, and 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 that's the real point of the game to enjoy the narrative. No, it sounds incredibly. Like I said, I'm, um, you got me stoked. And you said venereal disease. Seriously? Well, it it, it just says disease, but the, okay. when, you, when you sleep with a mistress, you have to you have to roll a die. It's a, the game uses a ten sided die. If you roll a one, you caught something from her, and there's a penalty. And when do, when does he start uh, historically? Does he start as uh, taking care of of the Frenchmen with the with the grape shot? Yeah, he well, he he starts at at in 1793 as a captain. Historically, he went to Toulon as the artillery officer at the siege of Toulon, and and that's what kind of made his name. But in the game, that may not be where you end up going. You, there are other campaigns going on that you might end up being assigned to. Until your first council, you don't have that much control over where you go. Um, after your first counselor, and of course, when you're emperor, then you have a lot more decisions to make because you have a lot more power. And re uh, replayability factor in a game like that would be if you win. Um, I think there's I think there's tremendous replayability simply because with 220 cards, um, not all of them are going to be played. They're never going to come out in the same order. Sometimes you're going to fight one campaign and win it, and sometimes you're going to fight it and lose it. Um, you know the way the way campaigns work is you have a campaign card, uh, and at, at the end of the of each turn, which is a year, you resolve it, and um, you have commanders in a commander box, and you have strategy and tactics in a strategy and tactics box, and you have to spend administrative points to buy commanders and buy strategy and tactics, and these will modify your die rolls to resolve the campaign. Um, and the campaign can result in either either um, defeat, bloody defeat, stalemate, bloody stalemate, victory, or bloody victory, um, and and all of which have different effects. Um, and, you know, and it can take if you get a stalemate, then you have to go another round of combat. But you can't use the same commanders and tactics that you used in the first round. So it, and you only have a limited number of administrative points. So it's like, do I spend everything in up front and hope to just win outright? And then if I get a stalemate, I'm in trouble because I have no, you know, no no more modifiers. Or do I save somebody like Marat, who is 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 good after the, after a stalemate? Do I save him and use you know? So there are a lot of a lot of little decisions to make that add up and. I really don't think that any two games will will play the same. So how did you not make a game like that linear? You know? Um well, I mean there is a certain there is a certain linearity to it uh chronologically in the sense that, you know, right. you you start as commander and you right. move to first council and so but in terms of within each period um, that's that's a matter of card draws, and and so for example, in instead of going to Toulon, there was also a siege of the city of Lyon, which was held by royalists, 
and you could be sent there instead, or you could be sent to the Vendée in, in uh, northwest France, which was always rebelling against, uh, against um, the revolutionaries. So, you know, there, there are all kinds of different things. Or you could get a, a post in Paris, um, you know, like at the Topographical Bureau, uh, which Napoleon was actually assigned to for several months and where he really kind of polished up his strategic theories. And um, Achilles here, can he end up guillotined by the Jacobins? Yes, he can. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get the game. He can. There's, there's a thing for being arrested and... Um, you can be arrested either by Robespierre or if Robespierre has fallen, you might be arrested by the directory. And th there are cards that will help you if you're arrested by Robespierre, but those same cards will hurt you if you're arrested by the directory instead. So, so it seems it seems way uh, compared to uh, Legions of Honor, which I don't want to compare it to. It seems more historically, uh, well, for lack of a better word, historically viable than Legion of Honor. I, it's, it's, you know, and to me in a way it's comparing apples and oranges. I, yeah, I've yeah. Certainly, I've certainly tried to cram in as many historical events, including some events that never happened. Like instead of selling Louisiana to the Americans, you can choose to send a French general to, uh, to the Louisiana territories to campaign there. So, you know, they're, they're, things that didn't happen, but mostly there are things that did happen simply because almost everything that could have happened in a life happened in Napoleon's life. You know, I mean, he, he had such a, a, you know, a wild 20 years. <laughs> and uh, like, um, did you study Napoleonics uh, in, uh, as, as a history buff? It's, yeah, it's one of my areas of interest. And, and when I, and I had read, probably a couple of dozen books before I decided to do the game. But once I decided to do the game, then I sat down and read like another, you know, another couple of dozen books. Um, is, is there a certain book you can, you can um, suggest to me that I can, that I can listen to audibly? I think it's available audibly. Andrew Roberts did a biography of Napoleon that, that I think over here is just called Napoleon, but in England was called Napoleon the Great. Um, and, um, that's the one that I can think of that's, that's probably available on, uh, on audible. audible. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, I'm going to, I'm going to check it out because right now I'm, I'm listening to, uh, Ben Hall suggested listening to Spearhead. Um, it, it's about, uh, the, the, I don't know, uh, some, some, some guys going through the Western, the Western Front in in Germany post post uh, D Day type thing. Yeah, I haven't I haven't read it, but I have seen that on the shelf at Barnes and Noble. Yeah. And have you ever seen that that clip on um, YouTube where the two tanks are battling each other in in the city of Cologne? Yeah, I have. Yeah, that's in the book, man. And the guy actually found the German guys who were in the other tank. I, 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 that flipped me out. Anyways, I, I that, that's unbelievable. Now going back, going back to this Napoleonic game. I don't know how much of a marketing guy you are, but you know this opens up a whole new thing for all these other commanders. You know that. I know that. I know that. And, and uh, is, is there is there um, maybe it's too early to ask, but do you have aspirations for some guy like Rommel, or maybe even M Mussolini? You know, <laughs> all kinds of possibilities. I, I um, right now I've been thinking of uh, of further back, either like Alexander or Julius Caesar, or maybe Cleopatra. Um, you know, it would it would be interesting to do a uh, a game with a with a woman central character. Uh, you know, Cleopatra or Queen Elizabeth the first. Um, but, but we'll see. I'm, at this point, I need to see, you know, how... Uh, how well it's going to be received. How well it's going to be received. I have hopes, but we'll, well see. Well, and I think, I think look, uh, I mean, you have a fan in me, obviously, and I'm not the only one for sure. And this sounds incredibly interesting. And I'm glad, well, I'm glad. How else can it not be solitaire? It, 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 
it screams solitaire. You know what I mean? And yeah. hold on, someone else, someone else had a question here. Ba 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 ba. Well, hold on, Ted. There's some some accolades here. So, Ted, you're his favorite designer, man. The Dark Sands were his first war game. So, what's next for the Dark Deadly series? Um, for the uh, for the Deadly, uh, which means for Revolution Games, I've agreed to do a kit pull uh, system covering all of World War II Europe um, on a single map, and uh, from 1939 to 45. Um, and then for GMT, I'll be doing um, probably the next one will be the war in the Pacific. Uh, and that's going to be interesting because obviously that's going to be a largely naval, naval game. So that'll be my first naval game. Wow, man. You're, 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 you're jumping from subject to subject in terms of warfare and, and era to era. Um, I, I can't do that. I, I congratulate you with the, the brains you have, Ted, because I can't, uh, uh, well, I, I'm, I'm surprised I could follow you for God's sake, man. There, there are um, there's certain areas that I know a lot about and I can design games on. Um, Europe between um, the Thirty Years' War and, and the end of World War II, uh, the American Civil War, um, and the war in the Pacific. Um, and that's about it. There are plenty of other areas that, that you know, I don't know nearly enough about to uh, to do a game on. Ted, uh, uh, let me ask you uh, an indiscreet question here. What nationality are you? My um, my mother's family were um, Scots Irish and um, came here before the Civil War and fought on both sides. Um, and my mother, they were my my mother was literally a coal miner's daughter during the depression uh, in, uh, in Richmond, Kentucky. My father's family is Russian Jewish and came, uh, my grandfather came to this country after the failed revolution of 1905 in which he got a uh, scar across his forehead from a Cossack saber. Unbelievable. And, uh, and my parents met, I mean, for a, a, a you know, a son of Russian Jews and a son of Scots Irish coal miners to get together took World War II. Um, my my mother was at the a nurse at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, and my father was a captain in the infantry, and that's how they met and 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 got together. Wow, and um, Ashkenazi? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, I mean, uh, so it was Ashkenazi meets Baptist. <laughs> <laughs> so you must you must have had some um, some uh, family that that <clears throat> were 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 stuck in Europe at that time and during World War II, right? Yeah, they did not survive. That's uh, I'm I'm sorry. That's uh, that's such a um, um, an emotional thing for me. Um, all that all that era. Um, I mean, my parent, my parents were both from Italy. My mom was from Campania. So when there was the, uh, the Anzio thing, uh, she wasn't that far from, 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 from that, you know, and when there was the bombing from casino, she was like 25 K's away. And she would tell me this, the sounds of the bombs would blast, would blast the windows and all that. And, uh, it's, these are horror stories. But anyways, yeah, I mean, that's, um, you know, World War Two. I mean, um, I mean, I would not exist without World War Two, but I can't honestly because my parents would never have gotten. But I can't honestly say that, you know, 75 million dead was worth me, but that's just. Yeah, I, worked out. I know. Uh, God, that's horrible. Uh, I try to teach my children why they're here. I'm here because of World War Two or else. Uh, my parents would never have met, you know, being from one from Tuscany, one from from uh, uh, lower than Naples, <clears throat> they never would have met. And uh, I don't know, maybe I'm trying to beat a, a dead dog here, trying to teach them the history of World War II. 
I want them to play war games, really. That's the end. That's my end game because I got nobody to play war games with, Dad. Anyways, <laughs> do you do you have a um, do you have a gaming gang you play with? Um, I used to. I don't really right now. Um, uh, may you know? I may at some point get back to the um, to the group that uh, that uh, in Lower Manhattan. Uh, every week or two, um, uh, but I had when I was in Florida, uh, I used to game with uh, Richard Borg, the designer of the Command and Colors games, because he lived lived near where. Uh, although pretty much all we played was Command and Colors, but um, <laughs> why does he does he have does he have that type of personality where he uh, he's the alpha male type guy? No, it's just the, the group that they have sort of that's all they play is command and colors. Um, you know, occasionally I'll peel someone off to play one of my designs, but mostly they just play command and colors. You know what? I, um, I'm trying to get my friend into playing a Napoleonic command and colors game, but uh, I don't know. We, uh, we have supper, then we have too much wine, and then we don't have any concentration anymore. So uh, that's what it is. So, Ted, okay. Um, we touched on a little bit on Paths of Glory. Is there is there going to be some sort of some sort of sequel by Ted Racer to Paths of Glory going on from that? No, I don't think so. I mean, um, okay, so that's a closed that's a closed door, right? Yeah, yeah, World War II Barbarossa to Berlin was my sequel to Paths of Glory um, <laughs> because I I that was the car driven design I did after Paths. Glory, and and I wanted to see whether I could take the Paths of Glory system and move it to a much more mobile war in World War II, and you know, with a few tweaks, I think I pulled it off. And uh, sorry, Ted, in my ignorance, that system could fit well in a civil war type scenario. And have you done a civil war type scenario with that system? No, because Mark Herman already did. He did um, <laughs> for the people, and. Uh, I actually, when we the people, the first game came out on the American Revolution, my first thought was, I'm going to design a game using this on, on the Civil War. And I had already started working on it when I found out that, that Mark had already sold for the people to Avalon Hill. So that was the end of that. And then I went on Paths of Glory. So that was it. You shut it down and that's it. Yeah, well, I wasn't, you know, I'm not competing directly with Mark Herman. That's, <laughs> that's a losing I mean, proposition. Right. No, no, Ted, come on. Seriously, come on. And and it's funny. You're, you're making me think of a story of um, Brian Wilson of the Beach Boys when he was recording <laughs> pet sounds, you know, and he, and he was thinking, and I'm not saying you were thinking like this, but he was thinking, man, what a revolutionary album, this and that. And then the Beatles' Sgt. Pepper came out, and they <laughs> shut everything down. <laughs> oh, man. Uh, sorry, apples and oranges, man. Sorry, sorry. Good story. Ted, uh, <laughs> going back to the, uh, how many solo games have you had? The Napoleonic one is the first one, right? Um. That and the the one computer game I did for um, uh, what was Shenandoah and then was brought up by Slytherin, Battle of Moscow. Although you can play that two-player, there was a solo engine to that too. Um, but yeah, this is my first solo board game. So who uh, like, um, was, was there a, a, a certain designer in particular that... that I don't know, edged you on to, to make a solo game like that? Or was it because you actually played Legion of Honor? It was because I played Legion of Honor, but I've been wanting to do a solo game for a long time because I play a lot solo, and solo right. play is important in my designs. Um, you know, even the games that I design, you know, I, I haven't done a solo game before this, but I try and make my designs as solo friendly as possible. So I try not to put in hidden information and, and, and you know, stuff that would get in the way of solitaire play. And, um, you know, so I've been wanting to do a solo game for a long time. This just, this just happened to be the one that clicked. Um, but I, I, I don't think it's going to be, you know, quite apart from doing more in this series, I think I'm probably going to try some other solo you know, efforts as well. 
along the same vein as the Napoleonic one, or you're going to try different soul uh, stuff? Um, both. I think both. I, 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 uh, hopefully, if, if the Napoleon would catch us on, I will definitely do you know another in that series. But I'm also looking at, at for example, I've considered doing a, a World War I solitaire game where you play the central powers and the system plays the allies. Um, yes, please. <laughs> yes, please. <laughs> Now, Ted, you know what? To me, you're an artist, okay? And an artist, once he's hit uh, his his threshold of I've I've done enough for this, he goes on to other things. Now, um, that this game system, uh, which which for me is very interesting. Uh, how far do you think? Because I think it's going to be very successful. Okay, and how far do you think you're going to take this before you get bored of yourself doing something like this? I don't know. I mean, I, I do get bored eventually. It's why I've done so many different kinds of games because I don't like to endlessly repeat myself. I mean, I do have some series, um, the Giant series, and and the Dark series, but there's enough differences in those. You know, they're not. Just all the same um but yeah i do get i do get more but i think i could probably do at least a couple more of these before i before i before i said all right let other people let other people use this system and see what they yeah. can yeah no and that's why i say you're an artist because i am one too and and you, you have to move on or else you get bored of yourself and then it's like uh, uh I, you don't want to do anything you don't want to do because it just it's, it's not cool um <clears throat> Hold on a second here. Uh, la, 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 la. Yeah, we were talking about that. And have you done any other games on pre-Napoleonic Europe? And if not, are you considering any other than the Napoleonic solo games you were talking about? The system, I mean. Um, I'm trying to think. The only the only one that I've done was uh, for Command Magazine a long time ago. I did a game on 1410, the Battle of Grunwald. Um, uh, between the Teutonic Knights and the Poles and Latvians. Or Lithuanians, and um, and I did that frankly because they asked me to. It wasn't something that I, I they had a they had a blank spot in their publication schedule, and this was the part of the article they had, and they were like, "Can you can you get us a game on this in in you know two months or whatever it was?" And I said, "Well, I'll try," and I did, um, and it came out alright, I think, but it's not a favorite of mine. Um, Would I like to do some some other you know uh, other periods of European? Yeah, probably. I mean, they're, they're, I'm, I'm hopefully. I mean, I'm 63, but I plan to be design. You know, if 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 my health holds up, I plan to design for a while yet. So there are a lot of things I'm going to get to. And Ted, when someone asks you to design something, is that a um, an automatic yes or on your part or is it something that interests you you'll take it on um like the grunewald game was there a mild interest in that or was there a, a, a genuine i want to do this was it like a meh type thing you know what i'm saying yeah no that was that was i mean i don't generally do requests i generally go to companies and say i'd like to do a game on this although i take suggestions you know I ask all the time, throw out some suggestions, and I'll see if any of them, you know, ring a bell in my head. That was a rare case where I was um, I was a member of the Command Magazine company, and so when they needed a game, I felt obliged to, you know, when they needed it, I felt obliged to do it. But it wasn't, you know, normally in that situation, if I hadn't had a personal, you know, stake, I would have. I would have said, probably said, no, it's not something I, I want to do. So when you, um, when you, well, when you feel obliged to do a game, how enjoyable is that, man, in terms of working through it, designing it, uh, you know, even opening a book, reading about it must have, must have been a hard uh, endeavor. At, so, at some point when you start, when I start thinking the mechanics, you know, I can psych myself up and get into it because you know 
all right, this is what I have to, this is the battle, I have to model it. What, can, what will work, <laughs> you know? And, and, then, and then the whole um, just experimenting with different mechanics things comes in and that, that gets my juices flowing, but, but it's not my preferred way to go. I prefer, you know, to, to be attracted to the topic in the first place and, and, you know, have that carry me to the point where I get into the mechanics. So now you, you have, right now when you're in the point in your life, you have that pleasure of actually doing that. You will not, will, well, there's, there's no reason for you to accept a submission that you don't want to do. Yeah, no, I, I mean, the, the game I'm doing for um, Revolution I, uh, was a suggestion they made. Um, but I didn't have to do it. I had other possibilities. For right, that. right. But I sat down and thought about it and said, yeah, it would be interesting to see if I could use the the, the chip pull system on a strategic World War II European game. So, you know, it was something that interested me. And I, and I wrote back and said, yeah, I'll do that. Um, so, you know, the suggestion came from them, but I could have turned it down. And if it hadn't struck me, I would have turned it down. Yeah, no, I know. And... Uh... I understand 100% because of, uh, I, I, I know a couple of designers and they say that um, that uh, it's, it's not the money that, that makes them do what they do. That's for sure, you know? It's it's the love of whatever, the love of the subject or the love of whatever, of creating, you know? And that's why I call you guys artists because um, there's, a, there's, a <clears throat> there's a kinmanship that I understand when you guys are doing something, the passion, this and that. I hear the the crowd in the back. I hear them. I hear them. But anyways, that's, that's me be going crazy. Whatever. Uh, we got another question from Nathan here. Any thoughts on expanding uh, the Dark Deadly system to other eras? Maybe ancient Rome? Um, that's an interesting thought, actually. I haven't thought about that, but that's... that's um, I have thought about using it for... Um, uh, operational Napoleonics, not not games on battles, but games on whole campaigns, like you know, the, the eighteen oh five campaign or or the you know the the uh, campaign in Russia or something. Um, so I, I do think that's a system that can be because kit pull is is a is an extremely flexible mechanic. I mean, there, there, there's not a way to do kit pull. There, there are a lot of different way, things that you can do with it, and that that I've already done just in in you know the dark valley, the dark sands, the dark summer, and the deadly woods. I mean, they they all they are all related. You can see the relationship between them, but they're not simply the same game four times. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean that's. That's something I will give a thought to. Ted, um, how many games do you have to your credit? For 30. So um, your, I, I know when we spoke uh, behind the scenes, <clears throat> you said let's not spend too much time on Paths of Glory. Now, is, is, it, is, is, that, is, that, is that a hit or a miss for you, Paths of Glory? Oh, no, that was... <laughs> That was a tremendous hit. I mean, that's been the most successful game uh, of my career. Um, no, but I'm talking been, about your pre your preferred. Yeah. It's, oh, I definitely consider it a hit, but it's not my favorite of all my designs. It's other people's favorite of all my designs, but it's not right. my favorite of all my. I like it. Don't get me wrong. I'm proud of it. But it, but um, there are other games of mine I'd rather sit down and play. Than could you, did you mention them, please? Could you mention them, please? Sure. sure. Uh, Dark Valley is probably my my favorite of all my designs. Um, I mean, it's a big game. It's two maps on the whole Eastern Front. Um, you know, it, it it takes a while to play, but um, but that's a subject that I I was working. I mean, that's a design that I was working on literally for decades before it finally came together, and and. And it was a game that I kept waiting for someone else to do, so I wouldn't have to do it. <laughs> you know, I see, I see. 
Some someone else please design the, the the Eastern Front game of my dreams so that I don't have to do it. And no one did. A few came close, but no one did. So ultimately, I had to do it, and I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed playing it. Um, I'm also um, uh, I like the Dark Summer a lot. Um, I'm a I'm a I'm a fan of Red, uh, which is my game on the Russian Civil War. Um, yeah, those are some of my favorites. I mean, there aren't too many of my games that I hate, and and I'm not going to say they are. Um, but um, <laughs> but there are there are, you know there are definitely games that I like more than others. Is there um, uh, before I ask you, is there a particular designer that that you 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 you, you follow, for lack of a better word? Uh, you being a game designer, and um, you seem to be very much in control of the subject, okay? And you seem also to be very much in control <clears throat> of gameplay in terms of mechanics. Now, why why would you give up developing to somebody else? Is that is that a is that your choice, I, or is that a choice of the companies? Well, I think the companies generally favor that, but I think that's. It's a good idea as long as the develop as you have the right developer. And by right developer, I mean first of all, someone who likes the game, but also someone who keeps you in the loop. In other words, it's fine for a developer to to come up with ideas of, of their own. I'm not thrilled when they stick them in the game without ever mentioning them to me. Um, mm. I, I, I prefer a developer who says, I think this is a problem. I think this is a solution. What do you think? And then I can think it over and say, yes, or I can say, give me a little bit. I think I might have a better solution. Um, you know, so I like to stay in the loop um, as a general rule. The couple of times there were exceptions to that where I was like, no, that's all right. You, you handle it. But um, in general, you know, uh, I, a developer is good because it gives you someone else to bounce, you know, ideas off of. If, if it's just you, then you know, <laughs> you. Can... <laughs> no, and, and 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 I agree with you one hundred percent. I I try to I try to 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 uh, ask the question with a straight face because. <clears throat> For example, I'm a big Igor, Igor Stravinsky fan, okay? And um, the, uh, Charles Dutois, uh, the Montreal conductor, did an amazing rendition conducting of the Rite of Spring, which blew my mind, unbelievable. And uh, I remember listening to Stravinsky or, uh, conduct his own... Um, <laughs> it just didn't work, man. You need... I don't know. You need input from somebody else to elevate that 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 you know that masterpiece, whatever. You know what I'm trying to say, Ted. Oh, I so totally I mean, agree. I just, you know, like I said, I just like to be kept in the loop. That's all. I just you know. Yeah. I like no, to and the thing is, the thing is, is that he might bounce an idea off of you that you never thought of, and it's like, oh my god, and you develop it. You know, it happens all the time. It happens all the time. Yeah. There are there are things in all of my designs that wouldn't be there. If a developer hadn't said, "What about this?" You know, what about mistakes? Mistakes in your design when you were doing it. Has anything happened that has triggered a moment of uh, of of a eureka when you made a mistake and it's like, "Oh, and it changed the whole system." Yeah, but that usually happens before it gets to the developer. I mean, a right, lot right, of my right, right, right. Go through three or four or even five iterations before I'm ready to hand them in. And at that point, they're generally pretty solid. There, are, there are always going to be problems and come up and changes. But the basic mechanics, I like to get pretty solid before I, before I hand something in. So that doesn't that that hasn't really happened uh, that I can that I can remember anyway. You know, I'm I'm going to bounce back. Richard Borg. Do, do you have any stories of you and Richard Borg in New York City? <laughs> No, no, I, 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 Richard Borg, I only knew in, in Florida. If you mean Richard okay. Borg. No, no, him, well, you just, well, can, can you, can you give us one day off the top of the head? Um, Richard, <laughs> Richard 
Berg, um, I loved Richard. I, 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 I was shattered when he died. Um, he, and that isn't to say that Richard didn't turn his, um, his sharp tongue on some of my designs in his reviews because he, um, and, and he and I often disagreed about what made a good game, but, um, but he was a very, very entertaining person. If you, if you, if you accepted him and, um, uh, I remember, um, you know, I one time the the first time I actually uh, met Richard was in the um, men's room of Penn Station. <laughs> We're in the men's room at Penn Station, and he was getting ready to leave, and I went up and went, "You're Richard Berg, right?" <laughs> and and he was he was like, uh, "Yes, I am. This is an interesting place to meet." <laughs> And and what do you uh, like, what do you mean? Um, he was an entertaining man if you accepted him. How um, he, was, he, was very, he was extremely witty. He was extremely amusing, but his tongue could be sharp. I mean, he could cut. Um, but if you accepted that, if you accepted that there was no malice behind it, because there wasn't. It was just it was if if he had a witty line, and and it was you know. And it was also sharp. He wasn't going to stifle it just because it was sharp, because he wanted to use the wit. Um, and if you accepted that, and 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 you know, and understood that there was no malice behind it, uh, he was just great fun to be around. Was there any criticisms that that um, you took from him that uh, helped your designs? Um. I don't know that there were, but but there are certainly mechanics of his that that I've you know that I've stolen, uh, borrowed. <laughs> over the years. Um, oh you know. man! Um, now you guys knew each other for a while. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't close to him the way Mark Herman was, but I I you know I went I used to go. Up to his house to game when he lived up in uh, Westchester or wherever it was, Yonkers, I can't remember now. And um, and I I helped organize a farewell dinner for him when he went down to Florida and I used to see him at conventions. Um, so, you know, we weren't, we weren't best buddies or anything, but we were definitely um, more than, you know, just know each other by, by reputation. Okay, so it was a respectful relationship, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What uh, uh, you know? Like I said, I was, I was devastated when when Richard died. I was, you know, I was I was very upset. But you know, happens to us all. Yeah. D did you d did you see it coming? Uh, his passing. I I had talked to Kerman a few months before he died, and Mark told me he wasn't doing well. So you know, I didn't know that it was he was that near the end, but but I knew he wasn't well. Do you know what he passed away from? Um, I think I did, but I don't remember now. Um, okay, um, I don't know. Someone had someone had mentioned, and I don't know why this sticks in my head. His eating habits. Well, he 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 had you know he he was a gourmet. He he really was. He was a gourmet. He he appreciated fine food. Um, I don't know. You know, he was he, a little overweight. Oops. I seem to, uh, there I am. Um, he was, you know, he's usually a little overweight, but I'm I'm overweight, you know. Yeah, so, so am I. I, I. You know, yeah, so, you know, I can't say uh, that that's, that's what did him in. I think, you know, he was getting up there in years and things well, happened. How old was he? How old was he? He was uh, in his 70s. He was in his 70s. I don't know exactly where in there, but he... he Is in his seventies, and you mentioned Mark Herman. Uh, I mean, you're a guy from Manhattan, and uh, Mark Herman is in Manhattan. Do you have a chance to to get together and play often uh, with Mark? I've seen Mark since COVID started. Um, the last time I saw Mark was at GMT East, been held 
uh, you know, that wasn't held the last two years. So like three years ago since the last time I saw Mark. Is, is there a GMT East happening soon? If it happens, it'll be in March, but not, you know, I, I, I just go to it. I don't have anything to do with organizing it, so I don't know if, if it's going to happen or not. Hopefully it will. If it does, I'll be going. Okay. Is that, are there any other cons that you go to? Like WBC, have, do you go there? I used to go to WBC. Uh, I haven't been in a long time since, since I moved to Florida in 2011. I haven't been there. Um, uh, I went to Tempe for quite a few years. Um, I had sort of a falling out with Consum World, um, but I may go back to that at some point. Um, I've been invited to a lot of cons in California, but but a lot of them are just like three day things, and it's a lot of money to spend to go for three days of gaming. So. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, I'm planning, and if there's a GMT East, I'm planning on going this time. If if the Americans will have the Canadians, for God's sake, man. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if you guys are allowed in, uh, but we're not allowed in, anyways. You know. And I think, when you, you're, actually, I think you're allowed in now if you're vaccinated. So. Oh yeah, I'm vaccinated. I got my pass and all that. My whatever you want to call it. God, what a mess this whole thing is. I can't take it anymore. But anyways, um. <laughs> no, it's 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 enough. It's enough with this COVID stuff, man. Come on, let's get it. Let's get it on. You know, Jesus Christ. God damn. Um, Ted, um, you being in New York, what's one of your favorite restaurants? Um, there's a, there's a, um, it's called Tea and Sympathy down in the, um, down in the uh, West Village. And it's an English place. And, but it has, it has really good food and um, and wonderful desserts like cakes that they smother in hot custard, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I really enjoy that one. There are a lot of places that I love that aren't here anymore. That when I moved back to uh, New York three years ago, they had closed, or else they closed during COVID. Um, so I'm still in the process of discovering new favorite places. But Tea and Sympathy is still there. How long have you been uh, back to uh, Manhattan? We moved back to the Bronx for a year, and then we've been in Manhattan for um, two years now. Uh, okay. I, there, there was this musician called Moondog in Manhattan. The guy used to stand uh, at, a, at an intersection. He had horns in his head. Was that? Did you see? happen to see that guy? No. I don't remember him. I, I remember the naked cowboy. I saw him plenty of times. <laughs> and was he? No, he he wore like a diaper kind of thing. <laughs> but yeah, otherwise, you, gotta, you gotta love Manhattan, man. <laughs> um, going back to a question: uh, Are there any uh, designers that you gravitate towards to, like, like? Uh, uh, your favorite author or one of your favorite authors because to have a favorite is is such a bad thing but one of your favorite designers um well i mean i have designers in two different categories one is designers i steal from i borrow from <laughs> and and the other is designers i like to play and they're not necessarily the same because they're they're designers who do games that really aren't my thing but they're constantly coming up with clever mechanics <laughs> and then they're designers that design games that i like but aren't necessarily coming up with anything new system wise um, but i'm a big fan of greg smith's solo games really eh I, I like those. Um, uh, Mark Herman is definitely someone that um, I, I, uh, I peruse for um, ideas, let's say. Um, <laughs> uh, and, um, uh, oh, well, I'll, I'll try and get to the strategist then, Kenneth. <laughs> and... Uh, you know, uh, I'm trying to think who else. Uh, I mean, I used to take a lot from Richard Berg, um, even though he was never 
you know, his games usually didn't work for me for various reasons, but they always had something in them that was clever and that inspired, you know, inspired some idea in me for a future design. Um, and would only a designer see something like that, or were would the gen general populace who plays that game see that thing that you see? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, you have to remember that a lot of a lot of players are, you know, would be designers, whether they ever get around to it or not. I understand. A lot of them, I think, do kind of look at the mechanics and and admire oh this that was clever or this and that whether the gen, whether that applies to the general war gamer though i couldn't tell you um, at, at this point after after 30 years of designing and over 30 published titles i don't really fall into the general war gaming population anymore so you publish what approximately one game a year i mean that's how it worked out but it's not you know there were there were gaps um, and then there were years where I published, you know, like this last year I published two games and the year before that, I think I published two games. So there've been, you know, there've been, there've been fallow periods and then there've been very busy periods. And how many games do you have on the table right now? Um, design wise? Does, yes. Uh, well, on Napoleon's in development, I'm working at the, uh, the World War II strategic Kit game, and I've been working on the uh, Pacific chip game. So um, those three right now. Okay, and I'm I'm gonna. I, I Kenneth says something here. Um, Batman. What about non-historical type games? Would you be into that? I don't know that I would be into Batman. Um, I am starting to expand my reach. I just uh, I posted on Twitter about this. I I I was never into Euro games because it always felt too much to me. Like the the theme was whatever it was was just pasted on, and yes, that, that could be anything. Um, but I'm discovering some games, uh, non-war games, um, that where the, the theme is really in the game, for example, Eldritch Horror, which okay. really has an H.P. Lovecraft feel to it, or um, The Captain is Dead, which really has a Star Trek feel to it. Um, so I am kind of expanding uh, my reach, and, and I think I probably am at some point, uh, if only for financial reasons, because the, the, the real money, frankly, is outside is of war game design. Yes. Uh, I, I may at some point tackle something that is not, you know, a war game, but I'm never going to give up. Even even if I do that and it's a hit, I'm never going to give up war gaming. That's been a hobby since uh, 1970, you know, so that's over 50 years now. So, you know, that's not something I'm going to give up at this point. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, that's cool. That's good. I have seen it. <laughs> and now, uh, when, look, Ted, when you're gonna, when you're gonna go, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna say out of your comfort zone because I don't know what your comfort zone is in designing, other than designing itself. Um, yeah, that's the thing. I don't know what my comfort zone is either. I find that out as I design. And that's why you're an artist, my friend. That's why you're an artist. So, um. What companies, because you're not going to go to GMT to, 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 to make, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. You're not going to go to GMT to make a million bucks with your Euro design, right? You're going to be hitting some European companies. Is that right? Or some of these, you know, something like Fantasy Flight Games or one of those companies. Uh, Are they still know. around? Yeah, I think so. Um, uh you know, companies like that. Anyway, um, you know, I think I think that that what 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 they're what they're called as. And again, this is an area I'm just exploring. But as far as I can tell, those aren't called euros. Those are called Ameritrash. Wow. Um, and and, uh, and that's probably you know the direction I would be going. In. <laughs> you so Ted Racer designing an Ameritrash game. Okay. Yeah. 
<laughs> well, talking about Ameritrash, would I be wrong in saying, my God, what's that designer? Uh, I'm thinking of a designer. He always does hypothetical games. Uh, World War Three, the end, the doom is near. Uh, yeah. Ty Bomba? Ty Bomba! <laughs> Yeah, I know Ty very well. I, I, he was the uh, head of Com Command Magazine back when I was and, part of all. He published. How was uh, how, how Ty Bomba? Bomba? Or six designs. I'm sorry. How was Ty Bomba? I, I, I'm trying to, to get an interview with him, but I don't think he's very um, uh, technologically available. Yeah. I, he may not be. I, I really don't know. He and I he and I used to communicate back in the days when you actually call people up on the phone. Um, so so I don't know how uh, how technologically uh, advanced he is. Um, but he would make a great interview because he 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 um, uh, to use a word you applied to me. He's very opinionated, um, and uh, and, uh, and he'll have a. Hey. I, I meant that. I meant that in all, in all, in all uh, respect, uh, Ted. <laughs> oh man, Ted, this was a joy, a joy getting to know you. I hope uh, GMT East happens. Um, um, do you do you indulge in tea or coffee or other type of beverages? Uh, tea. I'm a big tea person. What kind of tea? Are, what kind of tea are you into? All kinds. I, I drink all kinds. Uh, black teas, fruit teas, all kinds of teas. Okay, so, I, I mean, we're, we we got into teas, something fierce. And did you ever do, uh, in, I'm, I'm going to bastardize the name, the Guanju method where you have green tea and you do 15 seconds of steeping and then you do another uh, 25 seconds of second steeping. Have you ever tried that? No, I've never. I mean, I've had green tea, but I've never tried that method. Try it, okay. <laughs> Ted. It's been it's been a joy. I hope we see each other. I'm gonna end. I'm gonna end it now. Usually, I keep it down to an hour. Okay. And uh, man, thanks so much for doing this. Eh? Um, I hope we can do it again. Uh, when your when your Napoleonic game comes out, I'm gonna hound you. Are you okay with that? That sounds great. Okay, and I, and and man, I I. I can't wait for that. Do you do you know when in the P five hundred that's going to be coming out? I believe it's coming out in November, by the end of November. So, okay, okay, but that's too long for me. But anyways, <laughs> I, I don't know how long till publication, of course, but but it'll be on the P five hundred. Uh, you know, within a month. All right. So let's see here. Okay, Ted, I'm gonna stick around for a little bit. I'm going to see, uh, I, I don't see something here. Uh, yeah. Okay, Ted, thank you very much. Stick around. <laughs> People, thank you for asking the questions and watching this. And I hope I have the right ending segment right here. Here we go. <laughs>